Hello and welcome to Metro AV Tech Tips. I'm Brent. And I'm Jeff Picaccio. And as you can see, it is an atom. It says atom in the background, but it's not atom. I changed my bald. A little shorter, too. A little shorter, yeah. A little shorter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but Adam's so, smarter than me. That's Adam's the on the road this week doing some training out in Texas. So I was able to convince Mr. Boccaccio to come and stand in for him. Now, granted, he's not Adam, but we'll do the best we can with but him. But I can stand. So I will stand. In. And Thank I'll you. Stand Thank you. In, yes. Okay. So today's article, today's episode, is on RCA cables. Kind of, you know, we're following up with our analog and hi-fi stuff. It's quite the... Angle you have on your head there, Jeff. Yeah, I'm just trying to look at myself, you know. Are you pretty? <laughs> so, part of the reason I have Jeff is, A, he's literally right down the street from me. That's right. Which is a good thing. And yeah. B, Jeff used to actually own a hi-fi store. He's not just yeah. an HDMI engineer. Mm. He's a two-channel guy from way back. And we're talking prior to petrol-driven cars. Close to. So, and I was asking this earlier and wasn't listening. What was the name of your shop? Ah, uh, the name of the stereo, it was called the Stereo Shop in Boston. And what did you sell back then? We sold, um, well, in the earlier days, it was all analog. We, we were a big Macintosh dealer. And that, back then, it was Tanberg, remember that? Oh, yeah, sold those. And Acoustic Research. Sold those. KLH, the real KLH. Sold those. Okay. Um, then, of course, Revox. Sold that. And uh, let's see, what were the other big hitters? Then, were of course, NAD anything that came in from the Far East, like JVC, Ken, Ken, yeah, we were NAD dealers. We did NAD. Go NAD. Uh, and uh, but you know the 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 the, ma the major part of our business was Macintosh, and we were the only Macintosh dealer in all of. You got to go that way a little bit. Let me in here. Thank you. Uh, well, I got this camera in my way, so that's the problem. Uh, so yeah, we're the only Macintosh dealers from uh, Massachusetts all the way up to Canada. So that was that was our territory. It was good to be you. And it was good. Yeah, I mean, did a lot of traveling. Did a lot of traveling. Which honestly is why I have Jeff here for RCA cables because he does know analog. Has in fact designed some phono preamps and yep. some amps and some other stuff. That's right. That's right. So we're going to jump right into this because we've only got an hour, and everybody that's been to Jeff's class know that's not enough. It goes on and on and on and on. So let's start with. An RCA cable is an unbalanced signal. Yes. What advantages are there to unbalanced signals, and why do we have RCAs in your opinion? Well, the RCA... And I'll step out of the way a little bit Well, that's bit okay. Here. That's okay. The RCA connector actually was a, a real good universal connector that came out from... Uh, let's see, who made it? Uh, RCA? Geez, that's what it was, RCA. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a nice, easy way of having a, uh, a center conductor hot lead, signal lead, and ground. And the ground, of course, is surrounds, surrounds the connector, so it gives us some shielding. And it provided a relatively good overall connector for the given impedance that we're working with, uh, which is called... Hi, Z. Hi, Z. Hi, Z. Oh, you see, you, you got, I love it when he, when he feeds me lines, but I have no clue what he's talking about. Yeah, you about. know, you know, you know. You know I just got to shake your head out a little bit. Anyway, mm -hmm. It's called high Z, and it's high impedance. So when you get when you talk about high impedance, you're talking about anything say over, you know, a thousand ohms. So you know, and typically there are ten thousand. They could be at a hundred thousand. They could be as high as five hundred thousand ohms. The higher they go, of course, uh, the more susceptible they may be to noise and to RF signals and interference. The lower so they, they go. Why are they high Z versus say low Z like a speaker? Well, a high Z a high Z product, okay, will uh, will will adapt to less gain. So you know you don't have a. In other words, if you have an output of a preamplifier. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't necessarily have a high Z output, or or, or or it has a high Z output, but not a high current. And, but not a high current output. The high Z input is very low in current, and it'll it'll give them enough dynamic range where you get peak to peak that high enough. Ah, okay. So we're looking for like two and a half volts. That's the the standard is two and a half volts. So we're always looking for about a two and a half volt standard um, when we check them. So you have to be careful when you check these things when you're testing them, especially because um, you know it depending on where you text uh, where, where you where you test them at level can have a direct influence on A, their harmonic distortion, B, their intermodulation distortion, and for sure C, their signal to noise ratio. It gets better the higher you go. So the, the higher your output is, the better your signal to noise is. And in my opinion, the lower the impedance is, the more control you have over it. So, you know, they, and, and they vary. It all depends on the engineer and what he wants to do, because I, I can make it pretty much any impedance I want. Uh, the, in those days, we were with tubes. Mm -hmm. And tubes are high Z. They, those are those are really high Z. Right, not high, high volt, not high current output. High impedance. High impedance, high to, impedance. to allow them to be lower current. 
Well, no, they were. They drew some current. That's why they got oh, hot. By the way, before we get into this, you can always tell if Jeff's letting me know I'm wrong because he'll say, "That's one uh, way to look at it." That's one way to look at it. Not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> You got that, me. That, that, that's the you Jeff code. You, for, you've learned, you're not right. You've learned the code. You've learned the code. So, back so, to tubes and high Z. Z. So, you know, what, what, what it comes down to is that a tube, which most of you don't, probably don't even know what it is, um, it has an input and it has an output. The input is the grid and the output is usually the plate. And it usually gets fed a lot of volts to make it go, usually typically anywhere between 295 and 500 volts. But when the transistor became available, uh, the dynamic range of that really changed because the transistor only needed a few volts DC, but the input, which is the base, so there's a base, an emitter, and a collector. The collector is generally the output. So if you look at a tube, you got a grid, a cathode, and a, and a plate. And then if you look at a, at a transistor, the grid is the base, the cathode is the emitter, and the, um, the plate is the collector. But the impedance of the input of that transistor is very, very low. So very low impedance. So all those electronics have to be changed. So that means we have to make sure that we had a good match between two preamps, or transistor preamps, to two power amps, and vice versa, right? Now, with an RCA cable, and I'm going to push over again a little yeah, okay, bit so I can join the, okay. the conversation yeah, here. Right. With an RCA cable, how much of an impact can a cable design have on disease and whether or not one device works properly with another? It can have a, it can have a lot. Um, you know, again, audio is... Um, it is, it, it's very difficult to measure those things with test equipment uh, because you're dealing with acoustics and in the acoustical side, in, in, a, in, a, in one acoustical event, uh, it could be very just from atmospheric conditions, uh, uh, spatially in the, in, the, in the sound pressure side, the speaker side. In the electronic side though, they, they do tend to have their own characteristics. They'll, they'll change in, uh, impedance will change I was telling Brent earlier about bumps. We may go into that yeah, today. Yep. Um, and um, they'll also change in and um, uh, in, in how they respond um, with, um, with, 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 with transients, especially in the low frequency response. And again, we're dealing with current. So, so even in high Z and low frequency response, you, you develop some current. It's low. But we're also we're talking about a very, very small output device. So there are differences in when, when you do that, but the differences appear primarily from the differences in the, in the actual termination. It's well, the termination it's, it's that's funny causing funny as I was telling you earlier, when we started this program 20 years ago, yeah. I went out and bought a lot of different cables. Mm. And at that point, we did have legitimate engineering out on the West Coast in our Long Beach office. And they had some decent test gear, as far as I knew. And we started looking at cables, you know, look at frequency response and, and noise rejection. And you could take two cables out of any package. I don't care whose it was. And there were some expensive cables in this testing. Yeah. You take a right and left or an RGB, you know, red, green, blue component out of a package, throw it up on the meter, and the results were not consistent from cable to cable. And they were all, I mean, really not consistent. And it did not matter how much the cable cost versus how cheap it was as to whether or not there was any consistency. This is from a measurement standpoint, not from, from a measurement standpoint. standpoint. Right. We were not sitting down and critically listening. Mm -hmm. We were just looking at it for, on the scopes, yeah. you know, looking at the numbers. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, go to dinner, drink not a small amount of alcohol, confused about this, honestly, because this was not what we expected to find. Yeah. And there was an exception to this rule. The exceptions were F-terminated coax cables, and RJ5 terminated Cat5. We had a variety of those, you know, from the cable company, from a pre-made at a store, and they effectively performed the same, you know, minor variances, but not the radical ones we were seeing on RCAs. We went back and cut all the terminals off, ran the test again with just bare wire. Mm. Results were a little different this time. In fact, you could take any cable out of a package, red, green, blue, right, left, sub, didn't matter, and the results were identical. And more surprising to us, the variances between an inexpensive cable and an expensive cable also diminished dramatically. So yeah, if you got down to three or four strands of copper, you would see a roll off. But if you got to any decent level of cable, mm -hmm. you didn't see the change. Right. So our assumption, my assumption, was that terminals were the most important part of this. Mm. 
That's why we went with the coax instead of the twisted pair with the dual yeah. solder joints, which reminded me of the tape head days when you pick up motor noise. Mm -hmm. Now, was that one way to look at it? <laughs> That's one way to look at it. <laughs> so, how well, close were we to being... Um, you know, uh, you know, measuring just the transmission line as you did is probably the right way to do it. Uh, if you if your results were that, where you're getting different response curves um, from different cables, uh, there's only one place that's going to happen. It's, it's in the termination. And the termination has to do with um, how it terminates, not only where, where, where it terminates from the wire to the connector, but also from the connector to the next stage. So the female side of the RCA now has to... The receiving side. The receiving side also has to meet that connection. What a lot of people don't know is that the, 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 the worst part of a transmission line is the connector. Uh, and we call it a bump. I was telling Brett earlier mm -hmm. there's a bump. And, and my, my idea, by the way, and we'll do this maybe one day here, uh, and that is that um, we've got some special test equipment uh, that allows us to look at what in impedance characteristics there are on transmission lines. And we can do it for any wire in the world. We can do it for anything. We can do it for RJ45 or a Category 5. We can do it for HDMI, of course. And we can do it for a video. And we can do it for audio. We can do it for anything. We can do it for AC if we wanted to, right? Now, there's some things you told me earlier that surprised me, and we're back to one way to look at it. For years, I sold component video cables under the assumption they were 75 ohms. No. Because that's what we thought video was. Yeah, no, it was 50 ohms. Which, it's like, what? Yeah, it's a 50 ohm, everyone works with a 50 ohm line. And when you're dealing with high frequency, low, low, low impedance, it's 50 ohms. I mean, you know, 75 ohms is for RF. That's what they get RF for. That's what all that's for about. So, yeah, I don't know where that came from. Um, but we found that, I told you earlier, we found it by... Well, and that was uh, quite an interesting demonstration you gave me. So, can you... Reproduce that demonstration. Yes, Brandon. Really quick, uh, Symphony Hi-Fi. Good afternoon, Symphony Hi-Fi. I think they're in New York. It says, uh, boy, Adam aged, but got so much smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Yes. Oh, I got I got a working the age problem then, right? Yeah. Can, right. can you go over the, the impenis bump? Because I remember you telling me about this with some of your preliminary testing. Yeah. Well, you know, the... the, the you mean how, how I developed, yeah. how, I, how I discovered that? Yes. Yeah, okay. I did. By the way, here's your drawing tools. Okay, right. Well, we discovered, actually I discovered it because I was doing some research on a, um, on a video cable composite, so it's RCA, and um, wanted to know about, you know, how it responded overall, you know. And now remember, the bandwidth was small, five megs, that's it. That's nothing in today's world. And so, of course, I'm out there with my spectrum analyzer, and I'm doing all my, you know, all my, all my, all my, all my measurements, you know, and, and things, and, and I'm watching this impedance cut characteristic. And, and what I found was um, it was a 75-ohm cable. And the, <laughs> the, 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 the person who made that cable didn't realize. He thought it was supposed to be 75. Or 50, as did I. As you, right? And it, sh and it really should have been a 50-ohm cable. But the, the actual connector itself, okay, doesn't really have a set impedance to it. It's all over the map. So, and you have to remember that when you talk about low impedance, okay, um, low impedance is more tolerable than higher impedance. It's kind of like, uh, let me give you an example. Here's an example. If you took an RCA connector, high impedance, and you took it and say, uh, mm, took, it, uh, took it and plugged it into a power amplifier, had to put the power amplifier at full up, all the way up, and you took your finger and just touched it, it would hum, right? A dump okay. or a hum? Hum, thump, thump. Because the, 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 the impedance is so high that the, the signal pin is way above ground, way up here somewhere, like an antenna. So it's very susceptible to anything. So you touch it with your finger and you actually get 60 hertz to your body acting as an antenna. But if you did that same thing to something that was 50 ohms, Right? Now the impedance is very small. And of course, the lower the impedance, it's kind of like putting a load on an output of a, of a, of a high, high impedance uh, preamp. And of course, the output's going to go lower and lower and lower, or the input's going to go lower and lower and lower, and you know, you don't hear it anymore. So this impedance deal really had a lot to do with, has a lot to do with what things, how things operate, and how things are supposed to operate within the system. In all audio, it's almost all primarily high Z, except for speakers. Well, speakers, but in the in the low in the in the low level world, photo cartridges. 
Right, because they have damn near no output at all, and mostly magnetic, right? So uh -huh. magnetic well, cartridges. moving coils are even lower, and and, and, and the moving coils. But when you went into a um, a ceramic cartridge, that was high Z. Right. So you can take a ceramic cartridge back in the day, and I know most of you probably didn't know about it, because when you take the ceramic cartridge and you put it on the on the record, you can almost hear the record through the, off, through the stylus, right off the stylus. It was so loud, and. And quite frankly, you could probably take the output of the cartridge and connect it to a small speaker or earphone and listen to it. That's how much output they were. High impedance, high output. But then when, when we got into moving coil and, move, and moving magnet, the impedance dropped like a rock. So didn't the output, so now you have to have a special photo preamp, right? And but higher fidelity. High, but much better fidelity. Uh, be, lower distortion, better signal to noise ratios. But it got harder to make. So... Uh, you, you always have to watch those balances when you do that, and and I was telling Brent earlier when we in the earlier days we did tubes. We were, I was a tube guy, and um, as I explained earlier, um, a, a tube is naturally high impedance, naturally. So you know, in the day of the tubes, everything was high impedance. So that means that when we went to photo preamps, we have to make low impedance inputs with high impedance tubes, and you can do that with with the input stage. That's not a problem. But a lot of people just either went on their own will and what they wanted to do or they didn't follow the rules. And of course, things changed. The sound quality of the, of the preamp would change. Sometimes they would change a little bit in the, in the RIAAA curve that they use for equalization on, on the moving magnets. Um, so there's, there's lots of variables that, that, that get involved. And then by the time it gets out to the speakers, well now we got to deal with what the room acoustics look like, which is always all over the map. And, and of course, that's very dependent on frequency response. So, you know, I, th I think the main thing about the RCA connector is that it's very reliable, for sure. Uh, how many of us really would like to go back to component video? We wouldn't have to worry about all the HDMI issues we have now. However, we wouldn't have the quality either. But um, if we, if, you know, and, and someone said to me the other day, uh, I don't know why they just don't use coax. Why are we using this HDMI connector? And what they don't understand is that every HDMI c cable has um, um, you can do it. <laughs> it has four channels, but it's differential. And we're going to get into that. Brandon has a question. We actually have a few here. Uh, so Symphony Hi-Fi says, what is the best homage to use for a subwoofer cable? Well, that's going to come okay. down to the hardware. Okay, first it's impedance, not homage. I can give you a number. When you deal with impedance, we're dealing with AC resistance. When you're dealing with ohms, we're dealing with DC resistance. So what was the question again? Uh, what's the best homage okay, to use for a subwoofer cable? Okay, so the subwoofer cable, I need to ask you a question. Are you talking about the output stage going to the speaker or the input stage coming from the preamp? Well, I think he's talking about between uh, a, a subwoofer output on a pre-pro and a powered sub's input. Okay, high Z, it doesn't make any difference. It really doesn't make any As long as, you see, the, the real key is that you want to make sure that the output, okay, is, is, is low and the, the input of the next stage is high. If, and, you, if you follow that rule, it'll always work. And the reason for the higher Z is it, it becomes, in theory, should be slightly less critical. It'll be less, well, it'll be, it'll be quieter, right? We know that. It'll have more dynamic range, for sure. It's not going to change in frequency response. Then we have uh, Michael Heiss says, hi, Jeff. Hey, hey Michael. Michael. Of all as well in cable land. And then also chimed in saying, but RCA connections are also used for digital audio. Where yes, spit it. may be up to 100 ohms. Yes, that's absolutely. right. That's right. Well, 100 ohms. Yeah, uh, Michael, I, I think that's 100 ohms differential. Uh, sure. I, I don't. I don't know that. It's much. It is 100 ohms on the XLR. I don't know on the. Oh on no, the I RCA. know that. No, I know that. But but if he's using two RCAs, as he may ring back because he yeah, would he know. Uh, Nick Danger also said, uh, "I would love RCAs if people stop pulling them out by the cable." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's a problem for sure. I mean, that's. It's, Do you remember? And you were around when, when they developed the locking RCA terminal where you'd spin it and it would, yeah. oh, that was a bad idea. It was a good idea mm. that it was a bad idea. That's right. Because there was more mm. than one receptacle pulled out of the back of an AVR with those. Yeah, yeah, I know. But, um, and but the anyway, cuts. so when you start looking at what, what, you know, what you can do in audio, and again, I'm going way back uh, in, in the days of tubes, and, and as, we trans as we changed over to transistors, um, it was a, it was a new day in the engineering side, and I was on that. I, I, ironically enough, I was right on that edge where I was. I I, I I grew up with tubes, and just at the end of 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 my educational background, it changed over to transistors, 
And so I really didn't have much schooling in the transistor. You know, I had more schooling in the, in the tubes. And I had just a little bit as I got out, but the rest of it you have to learn yourself. Well, but now, you can. Let's step back a second. When we're looking at an RCA cable, we, Ethereal, use coax for our VLUX line. And this was based on what I learned on the test we talked about versus, I know a lot of guys use twisted pair because it's simpler and easier for them to do on the line. It's inexpensive. All you got to do is hit the solder joints on the tip and the ring and throw your oval mold on it and you're done. I went with the coax because of what I learned in the testing, which was the RF cables pretty much perform the same with or without a terminal, where the RCA ones did not. And we assumed that the issue was how the termination was done as much as anything else. It didn't appear to be the wire. Yeah. It appeared to be the termination process. Yeah. So we right. went with a, a coax with the with the center pin solder and then an overall sleeve that's compressed. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an opinion ver on coax versus twisted pair for the cabling? I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Well, no, the, the, the problem I have with that is that, first thing, you know, anytime you match it to a connector, as I just said, there's discontinuities that take place and that always puts a bump in the impedance curve. And, and what I was gonna say is that uh, we have this new equipment that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's got relatively, it's got relatively good bandwidth. It's uh, 400 gigs, so it, we got plenty of bandwidth with this thing. And what's nice about it, it's got a built-in TDR, uh, okay. and it allows us to what? for those without an engineering background. Uh, a time domain reflectometer, which does what for you? Which uh, well, it does a lot. I, I don't want to get too detailed into that because that's going to have to get back in test parameters. But the the the, the Look nice at it from an analog standpoint, yeah, what will it do for them? What 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 it'll do for us is that. We can, we, can, we can send a pulse down this, we call it an edge, and we send this little edge up into the wire. And the edge is in very fast, picoseconds, very quick. And then we look at that edge and we reflect it back, whether it's an open reflection or a shorted reflection, or a uh, loaded reflection, and we wait for it to come back and it tells us stuff. And when you look at that stuff, you can look at the entire transmission line and you can see things that happen during the transmission line, like what one, where the solder joint was, right? Two, where the connection is made on the output of the connector and the input of the next stage. And three, where the, connector, where the input of the next stage goes to the first set of electronics. So you can see all this in this, and, and when you get down to the real critical impedances, as we get down to the video of HDMI, we get down to 50 and 100 ohms, these numbers are very important because it can't vary more than, say, 10%. But when you talk about what you did with the crimping and, and all mm -hmm. that, I can understand why maybe you get maybe some discontinuities from one to another. I don't know, and I haven't experienced it either, Brent, a, a crimp versus a solder joint, okay? But I, what I do know is that when you go in, when you, when you, when you consider a differential uh, audio connector, right, balance line, and XLR for XLR, okay, and and where did we see those first? We saw those first in the output of the preamp. That's where it went first because they they were going long distances and they're very quiet. But when you when you consider the difference between an XLR balance line and an RCA that's unbalanced, right? Um, you know there are lots of pros and cons, and there's a lot of good things to say about RCAs. I mean, a lot of people dump on some some people dump on on unbalanced, and it's 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 really not that bad. Um, when you're, especially when you're down into the into the, uh, um, you know, the, the high signal level, level high, uh, high high data rate or high frequency level, it's it's good to do that. That's why they, that's why 75 ohms is used for cable TV. It's a single ended, you know, and it, it works. works and it works, you know. So as we but as we move into high speed stuff where there's noise characteristics like an HDMI or Display Port or uh, USB C or Lightning connectors, those are all differential, and we do that primarily so that we have a little bit more gain and we get um, uh, a, a better signal to noise ratio uh, by nullification. So that's why you can see so many uh, differential uh, cables not have shield. And let's talk about differential versus non-differential. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, draw me up what we're talking about yeah, here? Yeah, sure. I'm gonna switch to the overhead view. So uh, let's see, where are we at? Oh, that's good, okay, good. So let's say we have a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this, this symbol. The play button? <laughs> yeah, right. No, that's a symbol of, of an op amp, uh, an operational amplifier. And, and this is what we use today in most cases if you want to make any kind of gain change. It used to be a transistor that looked like this, or a tube that looked like this.
So we had base, base, collector emitter, grid, plate, cathode, and in this case we have plus, minus output. So a differential setup is already set up inside these operational amplifiers. And these op amps are basically gain changers, you know, gain stages. So if I wanted to make that into an unbalanced, I could just take that and ground one and just use one input and I could have an unbalanced system. That, that's all it takes. That's all it takes, yeah. And in most cases, they have too much gain, so you apply some feedback to it like this, and this controls the gain of the unit. So we can get a, an op amp, and one of the most common, easiest ones out there is, is an op amp that I grew up with called the 741. I'll put that down here if you ever want to, you guys ever want to play with them. They're really kind of fun to use. And you can take these, these op amps and make them into equalizers. You can make them into gain stages. And you can also operate things uh, digitally with them and by, by way of analog so that if we want to, these plus and minuses have DC on them also. And the DC allows us to shift this output plus or minus DC if we want. So now we can actually change the offset. This is called the offset. And in the, in the older days, well actually in the newer days, in, in power amplifiers they use the same idea. So in power amps they use a thing called a full complementary symmetry stage, which looks like this. And here's a plus and a minus, and then this connects to another set of drivers. And what this does is, which is class B, so it gives us this, and this one gives us this. And oh! Then, you got that, right? Yeah! Okay. And then there's, a, there's another class A amplifier right in front of it. Okay, in this case, it's usually a transistor, and that takes care of the crossover notch. So what we to, do to smooth that out, to smooth that out, noise. right? And it depends on these resistors. There's resistors in here that do that, and there's bias you can put in here to smooth that out. So there's a lot of things you can do to massage it. So you can see there's so much you can do on the audio side that could change the way the system's going to sound and 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 how it responds. Um, but to go back to what Brett was talking about is differential versus versus uh, unbalanced. Can I clean this? And yes, let you please. Draw some yeah. More? yeah, I mean I could draw forever. And that's why I got you a board. <laughs> Give it a second to dry. <laughs> no blowhard commercial. No okay. blowhard comments. So again, when we're talking about a, 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 a differential versus um, or balance versus unbalance, um, we have to look at is that in a in a in an unbalanced system, you have a signal wire and you have ground. That's it. That's it. So you have maybe some AC going on here, and that goes all the way to the back. So here's our input and here's our output. Uh, but if we go into a, di a differential set or a balance line, we use two wires. Okay, and these, these two wires, one of them is positive and the other one is negative, or one's called inverting and non-inverting. And it's the same way on the output stage. So we have this verting and non-verting system here. Well, what's nice about this is that it uses a thing called common mode. And common mode is nothing more than taking um, the one output here. Let's say we have a differential output here coming in from the op amp. What we can do is we can, we can take that, 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 these two, we run those all the way through the end, and in the very end, we take one of them and we flip it in phase. So if we have this one that looks like this, and we have this one that looks like this, it's, it's, this is all in phase now. You can see? My art's not great, but it's there. So if, now if we take it and we say, okay, flip the negative one, this now becomes this. This becomes this. This becomes this. this becomes, and so on and so on. These go away. Okay, and then it nullifies and, and it joins up to this one inverted. So now we get a little bit more peak out of it. But what it does is that it, 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 we're immune now from the noise that's on the line because that's in phase. So it's a nice, easy way of getting a, a, a great dynamic range with very, very good signal-to-noise ratio. So, you know, in, in the earlier days, it was used primarily in microphones. I can remember back in the old AKG 707 days where it was a microphone that, that they made into a balanced line. And they did that because microphones are... Low impedance. Low, 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 low trans. It's just a transducer that's not very uh, right. Low impedance. Not very efficient. Not much output. So it's got to go a long way. That means the 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 preamp stage of the of the PA say right had to be so high to get it up, the hum would come up with it. So by going into a balanced line, you now have no hum. So you know there's there's 
and, but for years before that, Letra Voice made, uh, uh, you probably didn't know who Letra Voice even is, but Letra Voice made these microphones, um, 664s, that's what they were called. Um, I think it was 664s. But anyway, it was, it was a nice mic, but it was unbalanced. And it was okay sounding, and it was noisy, and it would never be used for recording studios. And then uh, Synchron, Synchron is a company in Connecticut. They're gone. I'm sure they're out of business by now. But they came up with an electric condenser uh, balance line microphone, and that was the recording studios with Ampex and Scullies. That's what they started using for that. And eventually they went to digital, and that's the way the thing. So the whole idea is that they're both really good, okay? Uh, as my physics teacher, my, my, uh, my chemistry teacher told me in college, um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's the same thing but different. I didn't, do, I didn't do well in that, in that course. 220, 221. I think we got a little bit of hate from uh, Mr. Adam Rogers over in Dallas right now. Well, he should be hating because he's not here, and let's face it, Jeff's more entertaining. What do you mean hating? What does that he mean? Says, he says, yes or no, Brent and Jeff are an old married couple. <laughs> I don't know what that means, Brent. Sounds like fighting words to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's just jealous because he's not here. Okay, so you want to move on to... Um, uh, anyway, I thought it would be a good idea that we did, we did some... Well, no, we run some, some impedance curves on the audio cables and showed on those impedance curves what happens to the impedance every time we go into a termination. That would be and they, you, would, they, would, you, they would see it. And you were showing me about the terminations a little bit before we started the show. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that anybody's ever seen Jeff and I do a show together, what you see on the show floor is pretty much our conversations off the off show floor. Off the show floor. floor, yeah. We just... Uh, and we, it's, just it's, it's, a, it's a nerd fest for me. Yeah, we... So you know, the whole time is spent... But, and then he generally says, yeah, that's one way to look at it. That's one way to look at it. But the conversations just never stop. Yeah, that's true. So, so go you know, over the impedance. You were talking to me about the impedance bump, which you were learning. And you started okay. to graph that out. I did not do that yet. No. I did that before the show, did I? Right. Okay, yeah. Uh, use the uh, blue. It's a little bolder right now. Okay. There. Well, so this, this, this little device, this little TDR that we have, uh, you know, does some really cool things. So we, when we check HDMI cables, uh, one of our tests is for impedance. And um, and HDMI's got that, that that particular interface, along with DisplayPort and, and and USB C and Lightning, they're all the same. Um, they're looking for a differential 100 ohms, so we check it in a differential format. We do not check it in an unbalanced format. So unbalanced, each channel would be 50 ohms. So we look at it in differential form. So. What we do is we, we... And what is the impedance in differential form? 100 ohms. So what we do is we, we basically send this edge up, up the wire, right? And then it gets reflected back either from an open or, 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 a, or, or a load or short. And it reflects back and it gives us a certain amount of time that it operates in. But what it also does, it allows us to look at the impedance of the cable over the distance of the cable. So in other words, a cable can start here. And let's say we, we have this cable start and it's a perfect environment, an absolute perfect environment. There are no connections. Um, there's no outside influences. It's just a wire. And that wire goes from here to here. Okay. But let's say it's 100 ohms. So if the wire is designed to be 100 ohms, and we could talk about how 100 ohms is derived. Everyone, ever, anybody ever ask or think about the fact that, you know, when you buy a coax cable for coax for cable TV, it's 75 ohms, right? So how do you measure that? How do you guarantee it's 75 ohms? You do it with a, with a voltmeter? Uh -uh. Remember I told you, impedance, AC. DC ohms. So well, how do you do that? And a lot of people don't get it because it's black magic on how that's done. And it's actually done by uh, infinity. Everything is done in infinity. To infinity and beyond? Yeah, it's pretty much. And, and if we have time, maybe we'll run into that. It's really an RF thing, but it, it gives you an idea of, of how this impedance works. So that in, in a perfect environment, we have you know, no connections at all, and we have this, uh, this trace on the oscilloscope that provides us little, maybe a little bit of wiggle room, and it maybe it's plus or minus one ohm of, 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 of AC impedance. Okay. So, but now... Um, if we throw a connection on this, now we have to connect it to the oscilloscope. So now we've just turned into an unperfect world. We have to take these connections and get them to the input of the oscilloscope. So if we ran that same test, we'd see something happen like this. 
And this is where the connection of the oscilloscope went. And the same thing over here. So whether it's the connection of the oscilloscope or it's the connection of an HDMI cable or it's the connection of an RCA connect, doesn't matter what it is. There's going to be some um, event happening, right? And it produces these little bumps. And these bumps can be like fast or sometimes the bumps can, be, can come up fast and then drop and then apply this way. When you average this out again, we're now no more at, plus, at, at, one, at one ohm plus or minus. We could be at plus or minus 10 ohms. And that's generally where we stay. It's about 10% is what we try to stay in. So these impedance differentials can have a, a side for sure. Now on the audio side, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what you're experiencing with your crimps. Um, I don't know. The only way to do that is actually go in. And since you don't know what kind of equipment it was that you're using. Yeah, it's only been 20 years, Yeah, Jeff. I know. You, I, you know. you don't know. But, you know, there's, there's so much to talk about here because, um, you know, especially in the audio side, because we're dealing with not only um, the electronics that are involved in the transmission lines, but we also are dealing with the, with the room acoustics, and, which is probably the biggest area of, of, of era. And a, a lot of people um, don't get that involved with it. They, 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 they put padding up or, you know, I mean, the only way to do it is to voice the room and actually see what the, the acoustical signature. Is your room voiced? It is, as a matter of fact. You, gotta, I, you had to say that, didn't you? Well, you know, on the magnet pans? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're voiced. planers, not pans. Ma magnet planers, right. Um, but yeah, I, what you do is you, you, you actually test the room for the acoustical signature that it actually produces. And in nine times out of 10 cases, it usually is way off below a thousand hertz. Above that, the wavelength is so small it doesn't react with it anyway. But if you look you at the lower, step key, over, you're going to catch me in the face. If, with if, that if, you, if you look at if you look at these curves, you know, it'll go. It'll go. Let's see. I'll do it on this. Can you go to this again? Yes, I can. So if you look at a response curve from here to here, this is 20 hertz and this is 20k. Well, when you get, you know, when you when when you started, this is what the response curve of a typical room looks like. And then when it gets to about a thousand hertz, it's kind of like smooths off. So these, these peaks and valleys will, will cause major effects because they'll mask certain instruments that are, in a, uh, that are in a hole. And so the only way to fix that really is to smooth it out electrically. And I don't know of anybody today that's actually physically doing that anymore. I mean, years ago, there were guys doing that all the time. So, you know, you could do it with your ear, I guess. And, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of guy that goes out and tells people I can hear the grass grow. But... You know, I mean, I, and, and you know, and I'm getting older now. You sold enough now. products to those grass growers. I did, but of course I'm getting older now, and my ears aren't quite as good, so, you know, I tend to hit the treble up a little bit, you know. And, um, the loudness button, Jeff? But, uh, yeah, but, you know, that's where, the, that's where the Maggie's come in really good, you know. They got that nice high end. And I got the subwoofer, so the, I got a Valadine that does that, so. But that Valadine is tuned into the room, and it's tuned into the room in a certain area where I sit. So let's get back to RCA cables. Yeah. So... Are there any legitimate differences of a coax over a twisted pair for the connecting cable, or does it really come down to pretty much termination? It comes down to termination, in my opinion, and that's strictly an opinion. Um, you know, I've seen people use use twisted pair, and it still ends up with a with, a, with an RCA in the end. Mm -hmm. You know that, yeah. right? And so, you know, you get and you get all kinds of stories about that one. You know, the the, the first part is draining the noise away from the first part of the ground. Oh yeah, the floating of the, the floating of the shield. I mean, you know, I mean, the stories that come up out of this, and and of course, they can't really be measured too well, and so now you're down to the acoustics of it, and an acoustical event, and of course that's so personal. Personal, yeah. So uh, it's I remember hard testing to say. a cable that had three different gauges inside of it for different frequencies. Yeah, that's a good one. That's, well, see, that's, that's without a, great... a crossover network, it's like how do the frequencies know which wire to take? Yeah, no, but it's a great thing to offer because no one can prove it. Or disprove it. Or disprove it. <laughs> Just like, what the hell, right? It's a story. It may not have any truth, That's but right. damn it, it's a story. Okay, how are we doing on time? How are we doing on time, young man? Uh, 15 away from 4, so... Wow, any more okay, questions? Uh, no, we got into some microphone talk in the chat. I don't know if you want me to bring up. Try it. Microphone, yeah, let's talk about it. Uh, Nick says that... The Synchron AU7A has the thickest capsule of any microphone. Oh, is Nick saying that Synchron's still in business? Uh, then Michael Heiss tuned in saying the THEV664 
was a standard for broadcasting and is that the kind of uh, square thing with the no no no, 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 664, no, 664 was a, was a, was a regular microphone. Um, Nick said the EV 666 was the pro studio version of the 664 mm -hmm. with a three pin cannon connector that was completely disbarred from the face of the earth, but was a darn fine sounding microphone. <laughs> Why did they disbar it? I don't know. I mean, what was the... Uh, uh, after 664s, uh, we went into AKG. And, uh, and and AKG is still. Well, I today, remember seeing this one on television. Today's very popular. That's the the six six six. I remember seeing that on TV. Yep. Does it show six sixty four? Don't you love technology? Yeah, it is right there. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then uh, a little earlier than. Oh that, wow! That's the one you always yeah see him holding up yeah. Yep. A little earlier than that, uh, Michael Heiss tuned in saying the problem with the locking connectors isn't the connectors. It's the people who forget to loosen. That's the ones. <laughs> yep. Oh, so true, yep. Michael. So true, Michael. And that was a, is, is a great idea, but if the next guy in line did not know what it was, yeah, yeah it was yeah, a disaster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I can. And then, do you remember the RCAs that had the spiral cut on that would dig into the turbos? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You could pull yeah, the turbo. Yeah, particularly like dead on AVRs, turbos. they would pull that re that female yeah. receptacle right out. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Made that mistake once. Quit, quit using them. <laughs> That was yeah. embarrassing. And they scratched the hell out of the gold female mm -hmm. receptacle right now. That's okay. why we used um, the compression ring insert. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead, and by the way, this Friday will be on our RCA cables. So join me, and I think Adam will be back for that, won't he? So Adam and I will be discussing our VLOX RCA cables on Friday. Now, next week we're discussing ARC and eARC. I have Jeff again. Good. We so we're pulling him back into the day. Mm hmm. With ARC and eARC, what it is, how it is, and differences, and what it can do or not do for transmissions, you. Transmissions, where it's on, where it's not, uh, limitations. I mean, there's a lot. So to don't know. forget to join us next week at 3 p.m. Same bat time, same Jeff channel <laughs> for ARC and eARC. And if you got any questions, post them up. Don't forget to like us, love us, send us money, click the bell, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Subscribe. Channel. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Symphony, um, Nick Danger, appreciate you guys being here, and certainly Jeff. Uh, Michael also just said, as he recalls, the turbine design was a monster patent. Um, I didn't say that. <laughs> and Michael, I think you recall right. <laughs> I didn't say that. All right. Um, so long, so everybody. Some the multi-conductor gauge thing. Yeah, right, right, right. I'm Brent. I'm Jeffrey. And See you next week. We'll talk Have to you a later. great day. Bye. Uh, by the way, don't cut your wires too short. Reboot early, reboot often, turn off CEC, except for the new 2.1 domain. Yeah, I think so. And call tech support. See ya.